The Old Testament reading comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Here ends the Old Testament reading. O come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the founder, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and, and is seated at, at the right, right hand of the throne of God. The epistle reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 5. Every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Here ends the epistle reading. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. And they were on the road, going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, and spit on him, and flog him, and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand, or at my left, is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they became indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you 
must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. At this time, we join in confessing together our common Christian faith. Today, we will use the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Jesus said, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him, and spit on him, and flog him, and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. I'd like to talk with you this morning about something that might be a little bit uncomfortable. It's not something that we tend to focus on all that often, and yet it's at the very heart of the Christian faith. It's something that you really, really, really need to learn. It's a statement that appeared as the title of a devotional book by a Roman Catholic priest in the early 17th century. So that's quite a while ago. His book was called The Art of Dying Well. And while I won't recommend the entire book for your own devotional reading, I will certainly commend the title, The Art of Dying Well. Learning how to fall asleep in Jesus. Like I said, maybe it's not something that we're comfortable talking about. Maybe it's not something that we tend to focus on all that much. And yet, in a world that is spinning out of control and is feverishly devoted to trying to convince us that this life is all that there is, well, learning to die well is vitally important. Now, when we first look at our text today, Mark chapter 10, there's a bit of a mystery. Jesus is walking toward Jerusalem. That part seems pretty plain. He has a crowd that's following beside, or behind him. He has disciples who are alongside with him. Some, St. Mark tells us, are amazed of course, not amazed that Jesus is walking on the road. That's just ordinary. They're amazed at something else. But then others who were following Jesus were afraid. That seems strange to me. In fact, it helps to look just before our text today. A little earlier in John chapter 10, uh, Jesus uh, is approached by St. Peter. Peter comes up and says, look, we have left everything and followed you. Peter's expecting some sort of a reward. And Jesus responds. He says, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers, children and lands with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. And I think that's perhaps why they're amazed as they walk alongside Jesus. Because Jesus has told them what the world will not tell you. That is, those who will be first are not the ones who are first in line. But instead, it's the other way around. And Jesus says that in this life, you will experience the loss of family members, not to death necessarily, but those who do not receive the kingdom. They do not receive the gospel. And you and I both know it's, it, it, when push comes to shove, if you stand on the gospel, the world will hate you. Sometimes even friends will hate you for the name of Jesus. Sometimes, dare I even say it, family will hate you. For the name of Jesus. That's a tough pill to swallow. But then Jesus continues. In this life. In, in this world. You will receive a hundredfold. You will receive over and over. An abundance. Of friends. Of sisters and brothers. Of parents. Of children. Look around dear friends in Christ. You see your family. Right here and right now. But then Jesus throws in persecutions. You will see persecutions. But in the age to come, in the age to come, eternal life. Jesus wants to teach his disciples and he wants to teach you and me 
how to die well. Of course, this leads right into uh, them being amazed, some of them being frightened at the prospect of losing family for the sake of the gospel, at the prospect of persecutions for the sake of the gospel. But Jesus continues speaking, and he says, Look, we are going to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. They will deliver him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise. And you notice that this is sort of backwards from the way that Jesus told the disciples what they were to expect in this life. You will receive family members and friends. You will receive uh, in the age to come eternal life, but also persecutions. With Jesus, it's exactly the opposite. He will be handed over. He will be condemned. He will be beaten, mocked, flogged, spit upon, crucified. And then just one little sliver of hope, on the third day, he will rise. You see, things are heating up for Jesus. He knows that his hour is drawing near. He knows what is waiting for him at Jerusalem, and he goes there willingly. You see, Jesus enters into the breach first. Jesus is the one who goes up against sin, death, the power of the devil, this darkened world around us. Jesus is the one who steps into the fray. He is the champion of us all. He goes into the battle place, the place that we would never and could never go, and he clears the field. Sin, the devil, our own sinful natures, the world outside, death itself, he undoes them by his cross. And he does that so that we can follow after. But the problem is, is that some of us are a little slow to learn. Some of us keep on banging our heads against the wall. We actually call that sin. Some of us don't quite pick up on it as quickly as perhaps Jesus would like. You see, there were these two brothers. They were among the first to be called as disciples. There's James and John. They're in the midst of the twelve, and they're having a discussion amongst themselves. And you just imagine the way that the brothers are. You know, they're, they're elbowing each other. No, you ask him. You ask him. Finally, Jesus sees the commotion. He says, you guys want to ask me a question, don't you? Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, when you come into your glory, when things are good, will you grant that one of us can sit on your right hand and one on the left? Jesus, we want to be front and center. Of course, they probably think at this point that Jesus is going into Jerusalem and that he's going to be received as a king. And it looked for a while like he might be. He had a crowd following him in. There was a crowd that met him as he entered. He got a king's welcome. It's not out of line to think that James and John were, were thinking, uh, you know, we, we need to secure our, our standing. I mean, we were disciples number three and four right after Andrew and Peter. Surely there's a place for us right in the center group. And yet, Jesus says you don't know what you're asking. Jesus says you're not able to receive this glory. Now that's the beautiful thing about this text is that Jesus takes the idea that they have of glory and he turns it into the glory of the cross. Jesus takes their idea of, of majesty and perhaps fame and fortune and influence and power. Jesus takes all of that and he strips it bare so that all of us who read this account can see what really matters. What really matters is, well, the same thing that I've been saying as long as we've been in the Gospel of Mark, right? The fact that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what Mark 1.1 1, 1 says. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And nobody else in Mark's gospel really understands that he's the son of God until when? Until the cross. As Jesus hangs there dead on a cross, the centurion who's 
standing guard to make sure that nobody tries to take him down or offer him any kind of mercy. The centurion is standing there and he, he looks and he points at him and he says, Surely this man was the Son of God. That's instructive for us because it teaches us that the way that you know Jesus is by looking to the cross. Sure, his healings and his teachings, his miraculous feeding and his walking on water, they're impressive. They're, they're majestic. But if you want to know Jesus, you look to the cross. If you want to know Jesus, you look to his death. And here's the part that's so important for today. If you want to know what your own life looks like, you look to the cross. Because the cross is a sign of your own sin. As surely as God sent his son to the cross, did he send him because you sinned? Because you deserved death. Remember, death entered the world through sin. But now, dear friends in Christ, we are here on a Sunday morning on the first day of the week because something special happened on the first day of the week. Jesus rose. Jesus fought back death. And he won. Jesus came back to life. And when he came back to life, he instructed us, he taught us to trust in him. That is how you die well. Is that when you live, you trust in Jesus. And that takes care of it all. You look to the cross, you look to the empty tomb, you see the love that God has for you. And you understand that when you close your eyes, tonight when you go to bed, or on the last day of your life when you close your eyes in the sleep of death, you will open them into the glories of eternal life. Perhaps the second lesson for us after we've learned how to die well is learning to live well also. And the good news for us is that once you've learned to die well, you understand that the life that we now live, it's a gift. It is a gift from God our Father through the grace of Jesus Christ. So now we're no longer under the compulsion. It is no longer about trying to live a life good enough so that we can die well enough. But instead, we already have it taken care of. We already know how our story ends. And so God has given us the opportunity to love and to serve, to live as his children through our baptism, to be those people that God has called us to be, his sons and daughters, living in his kingdom right now, foretaste of the feast to come, forgiving and being forgiven, loving and being loved, that family that's ten and a hundredfold what we've lost for the sake of the gospel, we enjoy one another. Dear friends in Christ, I pray that your prayer would sound something like this today. Lord, teach us. Teach us how to die. Teach us how to die so that we may attain the eternal life that you have promised us in Jesus Christ. And in the meantime, teach us how to live, how to love and how to forgive one another. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.